So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Feng Xu from the University of California at Riverside. Uh, Feng Xu got his PhD in Berkeley in 1995 under the supervision of Vaughn Jones, was then assistant professor at UCLA and at the University of Oklahoma. In 2002, he became associate professor at the University of California at Riverside, and in 2006, he became full professor there. Feng Xu is an expert in the theory of von Neumann algebras and its connections with quantum field theory. In particular, today he will give a talk on rigorous results about entropies in quantum field theory, in which he will apply his expertise in the theory of operator algebras to give a proof to some heuristic results in conformal field theory. Um, fortunately, he is not here, not even online. The talk is recorded, so no question will be possible. for uh, International Congress of Mass uh, Physics 2021. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I was looking forward to deliver the talk in person and to have interactions with the participants, but um, this is the best I can offer at this moment. Anyway, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. All right, so let me see if I can get this to, to be full screen. Okay. Um, okay, full screen mode. All right. Um, yeah, so let me make sure I'm um, I'm recording. Give me one second. I'll make sure I'm recording now. Looks like we we are recording. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So, the screen one more time. Right, so, yeah, um, I need to keep track of my time as well. So let's see. Uh, okay. All right, so um, my lecture is about uh, rigorous results about entropies in quantum field theory. And um, this is based on the following papers. Um, the first one is joined with Roberto Longo. Okay, so let's um, see the outline for this lecture. So um, I'll actually spend quite some time describing the motivation of the main results. And, uh, and then I will uh, give introduction to entropy and the relative entropy. Um, and then I'll talk about um, a operator algebraic approach to uh, quantum field theory, so so-called nets and subnets. Um, and then I'll describe a particular result, which is the mutual information, a uh, special kind of relative entropy in the case of free fermions. And then I will talk about um, formal properties of entropy. Okay. Um, so um, then I will describe um, some um, results about the structure of singularities um, in a special case. And, um, and then I will talk about uh, one of the uh, so-called failure of duality because of uh, uh, disjoint intervals. Okay. So yeah, so yeah, I have said more, I have prepared more details here, but I think I will skip some of the details. Anyway, so let's uh, get started. Okay, so let's uh, talk about motivation main results. Okay. Okay, so let me move this a little bit. Okay, so motivation. So in the last few years, there has been enormous amount of work by physicists concerning the entanglement entropy in quantum field theory motivated by connections with condensed matter physics, black holes, and et cetera. 
Um, so, in fact, you know, um, the, the slogan I have heard from my physics friends um, is that, you know, um, entanglement is the glue of space time and gravity is the hydrodynamics of entanglement. It's kind of hard to turn these slogans into mathematical statements, but uh, they're very attractive slogans. Okay. So my, my um, point of view as a mathematician is to understand some of the basic questions. So in this case, some, some of the very basic mathematical questions remain open. So for instance, most of the entropies computed in physics literature are infinite. Um, so the singularity structure is somewhat times the cutoff independent quantities of most interest. I hope you guys can see my um, mouse here, the little hand here. So often the mutual information is argued to be finite based on some heuristic physical arguments. And uh, one can derive the singularities of entropies from the mutual information by taking single limits. Okay? I will describe more precisely what the singular limits are later on. But I have to say that uh, it's not even clear before all work that such mutual information, which is well defined as a special case of Araki's relative entropy, is indeed finite. Okay? So we began to address some of these fundamental mathematical questions motivated by physics work on entropy. Okay. All right. Um, not my page anymore. Okay. So here are the main results. So we have exact computation of mutual information for free fermions. Okay. That's that's uh, one of the main results I'll be describing in this lecture. Okay. Um, some of you might wonder, you know, what's the big deal of doing this, right? After all, you're doing this for free fermions. It's a free theory. Well, uh, let me try to convince you that uh, this is actually quite interesting results. Okay. So before our work, this was not even known to be finite. Okay. So there are some quantity defined by Holland and standards, for instance, that are smaller. So it doesn't imply our result. Our proof is actually quite interesting, I think. Uh, it used loops convexity and the theory of singular integrals. Okay. And to the best of knowledge, it is in the related cases the first time that such relative entropies are computed in a mathematical rigorous way. Okay. The results verify early computations by physicists based on cutoff dependent heuristic arguments. So for instance, uh, I, have, I have an incomplete list here by people like Cardi and Cassini and their collaborators, okay? So let me describe the results. So if you take a free current net, um, I, would, I will say more word, maybe a few words about this later. So um, it's associated with R free fermions. And if you take two intervals on the real line, so these two intervals um, are ordered from the left to the right, then the mutual information associated to these two regions are given by this nice Formula. So this is a special case of Araki's relative entropy, and this is um, this formula not only shows it's finite, it gives you exact uh, formula. So this is one of those rare cases where you have exact formula. So the answer is this is minus r over 6, and this logarithm of eta. But it is the cross ratio in this case, and in this case it's between 0 and 1, so this is a positive quantity. Okay? All right, so um, that's the exact result. And uh, frequently in mathematics, if you have an exact formula, expect to have various applications, and that is indeed the case. Uh, even though, I mean, this is just a mutual information for free fermions, it follows from uh, this result. And the monotonicity of the relative entropy, that any currency of the in two dimensions, okay, that can embed into free fermions, and the finite index extensions will verify most of the conditions um, discussed, for example, by Cassini and Horta. This includes large family, in fact, all known examples of car safeties. Okay? Much more can be obtained if the embedding has finite index. Okay? In this case, we also verify a proposal of uh, Cassini and his co-workers about the entropy formula related to a derivation of the C serum. Okay? In fact, our theorem connects relative entropy and index of subfactors in an interesting, unexpected way. Okay. For those of you who know something about subfactor theory, uh, you know that um, 
you know, Pipson and Popa has a result that connects the con stromer entropy to index, okay? But our connection is a bit different, okay? Um, it does use Pipson and Popa's result, but, um, you know, the relation is sort of unexpected, okay? There is also one bit of surprise. It is usually postulated that the mutual information of a pure state, such as vacuum state, for complementary regions should be the same. Okay? But in the current case, this is not true. And in fact, the violation is measured by global dimension of the Carroll net. Okay? Uh, and this is actually related to some uh, uh, interesting properties of type three factors. Okay? All right, so what I'm saying here, so uh, is that, you know, even though from the, you know, we have a exact result for the free fermions, but it follows from the properties of relative entropy, you can deduce a large class of examples. In fact, in all the known examples that the mutual information will be finite, okay? Even though we don't have exact formula for that, you know, because, but we know there are finite quantities, we can prove a lot of formal properties of those relative entropies. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, so, as a continuation of the previous slide. So the violation of this duality turns out to be related to logarithm of the global index and uh, some physicists call this topological entanglement entropy. Okay? There's a pre precise formula in this context. I will uh, at least show you the formula uh, perhaps towards the end of the talk. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, so let's now move on to entropy and the relative entropy. So let me see how I'm doing on time. So looks like I'm doing well. So I will um, give you basic definition of entropy and the relative entropy and discuss some elementary properties. Okay, so that's the goal of this section. Okay. All right, so let me first define what's known as Bernoulli entropy. So Bernoulli entropy is the quantity associated with a density matrix block in this part. So with the density matrix rho on the Hilbert space, it is defined by this uh, formula. So the norm entropy of a density matrix is minus tracer rho of block rho. So this is um, the definition. Okay. But what's the meaning of the norm entropy? This the norm entropy can be viewed as a measure of the lack of information about the system, which one has the state rho. Okay. So this interpretation is in court, for instance, with the facts that the norm entropy is always greater equal to zero, and for a pure state, um, it has a vanishing for norm entropy. In fact, the norm entropy, the norm entropy vanishes if and only if rho is a pure state. Okay. Um, I I should point out from the very beginning that um, this norm entropy is nonlinear in a state. Okay, because we have this logarithm term. Okay. In general, it's not easy to compute even in fine dimensional cases. For instance, you can see there are a lot of work uh, computing for non entropy um, in the case of statistical, mechan uh, statistical mechanical model on finite lattices, in which case, you know, your Hilbert space is fine dimensional and you have a finite, um, you know, matrix, even though very large size matrix. The computation of this quantity is in general not an easy matter, okay? Now, a related notion is that of the relative entropy it is defined for two density matrices, rho and rho prime, by the following formula. Okay, so as for rho prime, this are two states, and um, the relative entropy between these two states is defined as trace rho, rho log rho minus rho log rho prime. Okay, uh, like the Vanheim entropy, this is a relative entropy is non-negative and it can be infinite. Okay. Um, one way to think about this relative entropy is, um, you know, to think of this as sort of measurement between the dis sort of the distance between these two states of rho and rho prime. I should say that this uh, relative entropy vanishes if and only if the rho equal to rho prime. But of course, you can also see this relative entropy is not symmetric with respect to rho and rho prime. Okay, so it's not a distance uh, in the usual sense. But of course, you can symmetri symmetrize, uh, um, you know, can define the distance to be half of s for rho prime plus s rho prime rho. You know, you can roughly you can think of this as a, as a kind of distance between two states. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, let me see. Right. Okay. So um, one of the um, 
important things for this talk is, is the generalization of relative entropy in the context of normal algebra for arbitrary type. Okay. This was accomplished by Araki back in the um, in the early 70s, I think, maybe even late 60s. And it's formulated using modular theory. Okay. So if you're given two faithful normal states, well, omega and omega prime on the phenomenal algebra um, in a standard form. So this is a bit of description of modular theory. Uh, if, you, if you've never heard of this before, don't worry about it. We're going to have a, um, you know, a definition or equivalent definition in terms of states only. But for those of you who know what modular operators are, so this, this is a relative modular operator. So it's a relative version of the usual modular mm -hmm. operator defined for two states. And when take the usual uh, probability composition, and here we have this uh, relative modular operator. Okay? I should mention that um, you know the modular operator uh, in, in the physical literature is sometimes known as the modular Hamiltonian. Or we'll take a logarithm of this, get the modular Hamiltonian in the physics literature. Okay, so um, so in other words, in this case, for general type of non algebra, um, one can have this modular relative modular operator, and then one can define something uh, like Araki's relative. This is actually Araki's definition for general non algebra for general states. It's defined just to be the expectation value of logarithm of this modular operator. Um, sandwich between the, the vacuum state omega, okay? All right, so this is the uh, definition. You know, the, the reason I'm putting this definition there is just to show you that, um, you know, in general, there is such a definition, such a definition exists, okay? For arbitrary type of Neumann algebras, okay? So how, how is this um, related to the previous definition where we have, um, you know, um, density states for type 1 for non algebra. Well, not surprisingly, if you take type 1 for non algebra and the states correspond to density matrices, it works through the definition as in the previous uh, slide, you get exactly the relative entropy between rho and rho prime. So um, this slide is there to show that um, Araki's relative entropy is a generalization of the usual relative entropy in the type 1 case, okay? All right. As another example, still in type 1 case, if I consider a bipartite system with um, tensor product cubic spaces and observed algebra, which also, um, which also the factorized form, the tensor product form, if you take a normal state on this algebra A with a density matrix for AB, um, one can uh, do the following. So this is what's called the reduced density matrix. So you just take this density matrix and trace over one of the tensor factors here. Here is HB, and you get the state on, on this B of HA. Okay, so this is the uh, so-called reduced density matrix. Okay, and similarly, you can switch rows of A and B, you get row B as well. Okay, so the mutual information, I mentioned mutual information before in this setting is defined by the following relative entropy between rho AB, rho AB, remember, is the, um, the density matrix on this algebra A, where rho A is the density matrix, the reduced density matrix, by tracing over the factor of HB, and you get the reduced, you get the density matrix on B of HA, similarly with A and B switched, okay? So this this mutual information is a relative entropy between rho AB and rho A tensor with rho B, okay? So in some sense, it measures the distance between rho AB and this, you know, this factorized states, okay? So uh, in general, you see this rho AB is, is entangled state, so this will be positive. Okay? So it measures some kind of, gives you some kind of measurement of entanglement in this case, okay? It turns out in this case, the mutual information is given by the following formula. Okay, so this here is S for A is the phenomenal entropy of rho A. This one is the phenomenal entropy of rho B, and this one is the phenomenal entropy of rho A B. So this is not, there's some, this nice formula relating the mutual information and phenomenal entropy. Okay, and of course you, you don't um, have to stop at the bipartite system. You can go to for a tripartite system, for instance, where you have three tensor factors, and then 
you play this game again, and um, you get the following uh, interesting what's called strong subadditivity of a Neumann entropy. Okay, so you got four terms here for Neumann entropy, and there's inequality relating these four for Neumann entropy. Okay, this strong subadditivity was originally proved by Loop and uh, Rusky, but um, you know, um, but in, in this case, if you formulate this in terms of mutual information, it follows rather easily from monotonicity of the relative entropy. So if you set up things right, this inequality simply follows from the monotonicity of certain uh, relative uh, entropy in this case. Okay. This, um, in my view, I think uh, many people would agree with me on this, is offers perhaps the best proof of the strong subadditivity. In other words, it follows from me. If you formulate this inequality in the proper uh, context, it's just you know consequence of monotonicity of the relative entropy. Okay? I will say more about monotonicity of relative entropy in a minute. Okay? So this a couple of slides. Um, in this couple of slides, I specialize um, Araki's um, mutual information or relative entropy to type one case, and we get a very interesting uh, relation. Uh, in particular, this strong subadditivity can be formulated as um, a consequence of the, can be proved as a consequence of monotonicity of relative entropy. Okay. All right, so let's move on. So um, I said before that when, when I um, use Araki's definition, I, um, I sort of skipped the uh, relative modular operator because, in fact, in this case, there is a nice formula due to Kawasaki, which actually give you a computation of the um, relative entropy of omega omega prime directly in terms of states, you know, without going through modular theory or relative modular operator. Okay, so here's the formula. Okay, so this is the relative entropy. It's defined as a soup. Um, there are two soup here. It's a little bit scary, especially if you see this the first time. Okay, so let's let's look at the formula here. So the first soup is over all the positive integers. Um, it's a positive integer. The second soup is over xt plus yt equal to 1. So what is xt? xt is a step function valued in m, which is equal to 0 when t is sufficient large. Okay? So in other words, it's just, you know, um, you know, just um, a collection of fine number of elements in m, in some sense, right? So let's look at the integral here. So here we have logarithm of m. So when m is very large, this term is large. Here we've got an integral from m inverse to infinity, so you should think of m as being very large, so the integral is approximately from 0 to infinity. Okay? And we've got two states here. So the first one is omega xt star xt. Remember, xt is a step function. Okay? And similarly here, omega prime yt yt star. But yt is just 1 minus xt, so this is also a step function. So this integral here, even though it's written in the integral form, is basically a finite sum of the evaluation of these two states, omega, omega prime, on the elements in M. Okay, this is just finite sum. Okay. Um, but of course, you know, this, this is rather rather intricate looking. You got two soups here, okay? And if you pay attention to the to the position of the star, you notice that this xt star xt, and here we get yt yt star, right? The star is different place. Okay? For those of you um, we know a bit about modular theory, you know that's you know that's usually the case, right? It's very closely related non, you know, if you have non-trivial modular operator, it's closely related to the non-trivial property of your states. Anyway, so uh, it's building into this formulation. Okay. Now, um, some of you might wonder, you know, with such ugly looking formula, you know, um, of course in practice it's it's hard to do any computation with this. Okay. But what I love about this formula is that it allows us to deduce many of the properties of relative entropy easily from definition, okay? If you take this as definition, okay? So let me describe maybe, yeah, let me describe two properties here, okay? The first one is the monotonicity, okay? So what it says is the following. If you have omega and phi, these are two normal states on polynomial algebra, and if you restrict these two normal states to a subalgebra, okay, and then you compute the relative entropy of the restriction of the states to subalgebra, it should decrease. 
And this is very important. Remember I said before that most of the chiroconformal field theory can be embedded in the free fermions, right? So if you prove the mutual information, which is a special case of relative entropy, is finite, then when you pass to the subnet, it's automatically finite. Okay, so finiteness follows directly from the, this property. This is the monotonicity I was um, referring to early on. Okay, so let's prove this. Let's just look at the, this formula and prove it. Okay, all right, we've got two soup here. Remember this integral here basically means that you evaluate these two states, omega and omega prime, on those elements in M, right? Well, you um, this omega sub 1, phi of 1, is the restriction of the states to sub-algebra. So that means you're taking the soup over a smaller set, right? And when you're taking the soup over a smaller set, of course, it's smaller. So that's the monotonicity, okay? It follows from the formula right here, okay? There's another example. So this is so-called the Martingale property, okay? If you have an increase in net of phenomenal algebras of M with the property that this increase in net generates phenomenal algebra M. Okay, so any element M can be approximated by this elements of MI in a suitable sense, then it follows that if you if you take the uh, relative entropy of these two states restricting to MI as I goes to infinity, this is going to converge to uh, the relative entropy here. Okay. This is a very nice property. Okay. So, it, I mean, in some sense, it gives you a way of computing this relative entropy by using, you know, suitable something you know, uh, you know, approximation. So, in particular, sometimes you can even get MI to be fine dimension, okay? So, at least, um, you know, this is a desirable result, okay? Um, now, let's prove this. So, why is this true, okay? So, I want to prove a sequence here converges to this one here. By monotonicity, I know this sequence is increasing. Okay, so we have an increase in sequence. We know it converges somewhere, but uh, we want to prove it actually converges to this relative entropy, right? So let's just use the definition of relative entropy of S omega 1, S omega 2 here. Let's just replace omega by omega 1, omega prime by omega 2, okay? And let's look at this two soup. Forget about the soup. What is this? This is a log of something very large minus you know, a finite uh, combination of um, evaluation of the states omega and omega prime on elements in M, right? The only fine number of elements in M here, okay? But M I approximate M. So when I is sufficiently large, I can approximate this finite sum by elements in M I, okay? That gives you the proof. So that means this, when I is large enough, this, this thing here can get arbitrarily close to S omega 1, S omega 2. Okay, as omega 1, omega 2 here. So that gives you the, the proof of this um, um, Martingale property, okay, which of course is very important. Okay, there's some more properties here. Um, I guess I, I'll skip some of these properties. Okay, I should mention that for type 3 factors, one of the entropy is always infinite. Okay, but we should see in many cases the mutual information is finite. Okay, by singular limits, um, we can also explore the singularities from our entropy from mutual information, I think, which is important from a physicist's point of view. Okay? By taking singular limits, I mean you like the intervals getting closer to each other. Okay? So the formal pro properties from our entropy is a useful improving properties of mutual information. Okay? So that concludes my discussion about entropy and the relative entropy. Okay? So let me see. Uh, right. So I have about half an hour left. So. Let me, uh, let me move on to the next one. So, gradient nets and subnets. <laughs> so, I think I will be brief uh, in this. I will just give you some hints about, you know, uh, one particular way, I think a very natural way of formulating quantum field theory uh, using um, uh, the net of observables, okay? So, um, right, so um, the examples I have described mostly are conformal field theory, chiral conformal field theory in two dimensions. So that's why the Mobius group uh, plays a very important role. And um, a net of non algebra is basically assigned the intervals of the circle to observables associated with such a circle. So this, this is a phonon algebra uh, acting in a Hilbert space. And this assignment from the interval to the algebra must satisfy some very 
natural conditions. Okay, so I mean, at least some of these conditions here, they're all very natural. So maybe I will just say a few, or, few of them. So for instance, the isotonic condition simply says that if you have two intervals, one is containing the other, then the phenomenon algebra associated with smaller one is naturally contained in the phenomenon algebra associated to the bigger one. Okay. <clears throat> and then um, the covariance condition, um, and even the conformal covariance condition, positivity of the energy. So here, um, degenerate the rotation subgroup, this is known as the conformal Hamiltonian. We require this spectrum to be bounded from below. Okay. There are some locality conditions. So observables uh, from intervals which are disjoint from each other supposed to commute. Okay. But uh, in the case of Fermionet, we ask this to be, uh, this is a graded commutator. Okay. All right. And then the exact existence of vacuum and so forth. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so let me uh, quickly uh, through this. So maybe maybe I should say a few words for um, uh, potential audience, uh, physicist audience uh, to this lecture. So um, in this case, the modular operator, um, in fact, has a geometric meaning. So for instance, modular operators are related to the boost and, um, right, so the modular conjugation is the reflection, okay? So, yeah, so mathematicians say that modular automorphism is geometric, and this plays a very important role. Okay, um, yeah, so there's a bit more technical conditions, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk more about this. And here's the notion of complete rationality. I think, um, due to lack of time, I probably just uh, will not discuss this anymore, okay? Right, so uh, the split property here is here to, to uh, you know, result has played a very important role, for instance, in defining the phenomenon entropy for, um, you know, for, for nets of algebras, okay? Even though, you know, even though if you if you define this naively, you get infinity, but if you use your split property, you can actually get some nice type of one phenomenon algebra where the phenomenon entropy is finite, okay? Anyway, so I'll, I don't have time to discuss this, but uh, yeah, so let me... Um, let me skip this and entropy as well. Um, right. So let me uh, go quickly to mutual information in the case of free fermions. Uh, let's see. Right. I think I have about half an hour left. So let's uh, let's do the mutual information in the case of free fermions. Okay. So so I'm talking about our free fermions. So this. Um, when we are formulating this, is considered Hilbert space, a square integrable functions on the circle. And you can decompose this function into um, positive frequency and negative frequencies. By this, I mean functions with negative four coefficients vanish. So that's h plus, and then we have h minus. Okay? And then uh, when do what's called the Dirac C construction. Um, so um, this, you know, to make the energy positive. So I will skip this and I will just go down to uh, what, what mutual information we're computing here. Okay. So this Dirac C construction gives rise to a gradient net as follows. So if you fix the interval on the circle, you take the Bonheim algebra generated by such um, uh, you know, you know, self-adjoint uh, you know, combination of creation and annihilation operator, like this. Okay. And then you know, you just take your psi here to be, you know, a function with support on interval i, and this generates from my algebra, okay? So this is what's called the net of our free fermions, okay? Okay, so what, what, what's the uh, mutual information we're going to consider, okay? So we fix two disjoint intervals, okay? So this is i1, i2. So the mutual information we're going to compute is this one. So omega is the vacuum state, the Dirac C, okay, the vacuum state. And here we have omega 1 tensor, there's a uh, subscript here, 2, omega 2. So don't worry about this 2. It simply indicates this tensor is the graded tensor product because we have free fermion net. It's a graded, um, it's not a local net, it's twisted local. So yeah, just, you know, this is a technicality, but uh, let's not worry about this. So basically we're computing the relative entropy between omega and this tensor product. So omega 1 is the restriction of omega to the, uh, the algebra observables associated with i1 and similarly 
inside tube. Okay, so this is the quality, the main quality of interest. Okay, so the, the next few transparencies, you know, prepare all the technical details in computing this particular relative entropy. I have said before that computation of relative entropy is, is highly non-trivial. Okay? It's, um, it's only in very rare cases we can actually get some good handle on the, on the results. Okay? And uh, free fermion is, is an extremely uh, exceptional case. Okay? So here are some of the steps involved in computing this free fermion um, in the, the mutual information free fermion case. So let me uh, maybe skip some of these technical details. Maybe I just show you what are the steps involved. So it turns out that um, in this case, in order to compute this, you have to, um, um, so in this case, the Hardy space projection can be written as some kind of uh, Hilbert transform. It's a singular integral. And um, once you distangle this, um, mutual information, you realize that you have to solve some spectral problem, okay? So, um, yeah, so let me let me uh, go down to, yeah, so in fact, this is quite technical, um, you know, um, we basically use everything we know about, um, you know, operator complexity, uh, loops, uh, complexity, and so forth, okay? So putting all this uh, into, right, so, yeah, so there, there are a lot of uh, technical issues here, maybe I will in the interest of time, I will skip that. I will just get down to, um, right, so get down to, yeah, so so let me mention that the proof is actually, we use loops joint complexity. It's, it's not the usual complexity, but a little bit more generalized version of this. And then um, the careful approximation argument. And finally, um, the problem is now reduced the computation of a trace of a particular operator, okay? And um, it's really fortunate that uh, this particular operator, um, you know, you know, involves um, singular integral. And when you write it, the spectrum of this particular operator is related to the riemann hilbert problem, okay? So here's the riemann hilbert problem, okay? So let me write down what the problem is. Remember this I1, I2 are two disjoint intervals, okay? And I is the disjoint union of these two, okay? And um, the integral operator, the spectrum of integral operator we want to we want to find is this particular one, okay? This is the Hilbert transform, okay? So in other words, we need to find the resolvent of this operator in order to compute its trace, okay? Um, well, it's related. This is the famous riemann hilbert problem. I think even the original problem like this Okay. And uh, fortunately for us, the, the solution is known in this case, and um, you put those solutions together, uh, this is the, uh, the result. Okay. So let me go through this. There's still some technical issues one has to worry about, but uh, anyway, so let me show you the, the end result. Okay? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, <laughs> here's the here is a bit, uh, you know, interesting to compute this these integrals. So once you um, get all the technical details right, and then you know, in the, then you do the computation uh, in in the crucial lemma before, I guess, right here, this particular kernel, and um, you know, it's interesting to see that you get this number one over twelve, and it follows from Euler's famous solution to Parcel's problem. Okay, so the the famous formula that on the green square, uh, when a is greater equal to one, add up to pi square over six. Okay, so finally put all the ingredients together, you get uh, this this formula here. So let me mention this is the um, mutual information formula for R free fermions. It's given by the following formula. So R is the number of free fermions, and here we got this gi one gi two minus gi one union with gi two, where gi is defined for each interval by this formula. Okay. There's this interesting number one over six. It comes from this uh, famous formula. Okay. Anyway, so um, yeah, so I think it's quite um, you know it's quite interesting that you know one has this exact computation and and uh, the mathematics involved is um, is quite interesting. I think. Anyway, all right. So that's the that's the result for uh, exact result of mutual information for the free fermion case. Okay. 
All right, so let me check my time. I want to make sure that uh, I'm time with this. So we got about 20 some minutes left. So, right. So let's now uh, move on to uh, what I call the formal properties of entropy free formula. So maybe before I do that, uh, let me mention that, you know, our computation here, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same as what you usually see in the physics literature, right? In the physics literature, the entropy is usually com computed using uh, what they call the replica trick. It's a very powerful technique, but unfortunately, uh, it's not on a solid mathematical ground. Okay, so I think one of the major questions is to, you know, is to, um, um, you know, try to make a uh, replica trick more precise. But I think that that could be a long-term project. Okay? You mean in the case of statistical mechanics, you know, you see, you can see previous work on replica trick, which is quite intricate. Okay? But anyway, so that's just one comment before I move on to the next one. Okay, so... Um, Right, so now I want to talk about the formal properties of entropies for free fermions, okay? So, so what are the formal properties, okay? Um, right. So notice that, you know, in the example I discussed before, you see, this, this uh, mutual information takes the form which looks like, you know, the formula for, you know, for, for, for Neumann entropy, so this is GI, GI1 looks like a phenomenon entropy associated with this interval I1. But of course, we know that cannot be true. This cannot be literally the phenomenon entropy, the, the, the phenomenon entropy associated with the, um, with the observable algebras uh, localized on interval I1 because that's a type 3 1 factor, right? This would be infinity, okay? So, I mean, if you think of this as, as a phenomenon entropy, this would not be right. We got infinity plus infinity minus another infinity. But I think one of the interesting thing here is that if you think of this as Fermat entropy, we know infinity minus infinity can be anything, right? It just turns out in this case, you know, if you suitably normalize this infinity, you get a finite, meaningful relative entropy, okay? So this is important, I think. So in some sense, this GI1 can be thought of as a, as a regularized uh, Fermat entropy, okay? It's no longer, I mean, because the Neumann entropy associated with type 3 factors infinity, so the, the next best hope would be a regularized version. And it turns out this regularized version does indeed exist in the free fermion case. Okay, and we'll see later on that it does exist in many, many cases. Okay? So I think this deserves further study. Okay. Um, um, but I should point out from the very beginning that the, this regularized phenomenon entropy is not phenomenon entropy. In fact, it's not not even positive. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it doesn't have you know the nice um, properties from phenomenon entropy for fine dimensional algebras. Okay. But you know, but it still satisfies some of the very nice formal properties. Okay. So that's that's what uh, you know this section five is all about. So in this section five, I investigate, uh, or we investigate uh, many of these formal properties. In fact, this is uh, strongly motivated by, um, by uh, discussions by Cassini and uh, his co-workers. Okay? So um, we managed to uh, put, uh, prove some uh, mathematical results concerning this regularized entropy. Okay? So maybe I will just point out one, one such uh, Right, for probably so. Yeah, I'll just give you one such. So, all right. So, these are formal properties, and then um, I will describe structure of singularities um, in a controlled setting. Okay, it has some very nice properties, also relating to the formal properties I, I described before. Okay, so maybe before I do that, I should also mention this uh, regularized dimension. It's um, I think there's still more to say about them, but. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, so let's, maybe I'll give you one such properties of the singularity structure, the singularity structure as you mentioned before. Okay. So maybe let's, let's uh, look at this theorem, but let's look at part two, okay? See what this uh, result is all about. And what I mean by, you know, sometimes when you, when you take a single limit, you recover some of the 
very interesting properties of, of uh, you know, of the underlying system. Okay, so here's one example. Okay, so let's we are on the real line. This is still in the chiral safety case. So on a circle or extended real line. So I have a one a two epsilon. Here, this is one interval, and c is a two b two. So a two epsilon is you know a two. When epsilon is very small, a2 epsilon is very close to a2. So it's within epsilon distance from a2, okay? But it's not a2. So these are still two disjoint intervals, okay? If you compute the relative entropy, um, the mutual information in this case, this app denotes the mutual information in this case, um, you get a, a result which looks like this. This is part of the theorem, okay? So this R is the Number three fermions, you got some something that looks like cross ratio, and here you got logarithm of epsilon. So there is a log epsilon divergence here. Okay, and let's pay attention to this part, minus half log of mu b and o epsilon part. This part goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So this part here is not a universal term. Okay, this term is very important um, in the representation theory of component. This is the mu b is the global index, okay, it's the sum of um, all the um, irreducible indices, okay, and, and and also there's a there's a factor of minus half here, okay. Uh, in the physical literature, this is sometimes known as the uh, topological entropy, okay, but precise relation um, to, um, to the to the one, to the <clears throat> you later results in literature is still, in physical literature is not, still not very clear, okay. So um, this is not this is one example of taking what I mean by taking single limits. Sometimes you see some universal term um, which reflects what's uh, you know the interesting structure properties of an underlying system. Okay. All right, so right, so this is what I said earlier. This agrees with postulates of Cassini Hota in the discussion of a C theorem using relative entropies. Okay. And also the topological entropy discussed, for example, by Katayev and Prisco. Okay. Anyway, so um, right. Let's uh, continue now. So, right. So let me uh, let me go move on to the uh, to the um, what I call the duality, uh, as I mentioned before. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's look at the duality in this case. Okay, so so it's usually postulated that mutual information for you know for complementary regions should be, um, you know, should be um, should be you know for, for pure state should be equal, right? Because the state is is pure. But uh, in this case, there's a subtlety because in the in the chiral conformal net case, um, if you take two disjoint interval, and you take observables localized on this two disjoint interval, um, the commutant of this uh, algebra of observables is not the, um, the algebra of observables localized on the complement. Okay, this is a uh, this is a special property of type three factors, and uh, in in the, in, the, in the particular case, so that's why you know uh, you don't have the usual uh, uh, duality. So the mutual information associated A B and the mutual information associated with its complement um, is not the same, and because the global index is greater than one. Okay, so. Um, so the du the failure of that duality is actually measured by the global index in this case. Okay. Now, um, if you do this formally, you actually um, you, you will see that um, if you don't do this carefully, you don't you don't see uh, that's the case. So in fact, we uh, we actually struggled uh, quite some time before we realized that's the case. You know, if you do this formally, um, you will think that uh, you know the mutual information. For pure states, you know, for regions and its complement regions should be the same, but um, turns out not to be the case. Okay, so here is here is a little sketch of that fact. Maybe I will just say uh, what it really means. So, if you if you do this naively using, uh, for instance, using split property using approximation, you realize that um, you know even though formally you can write this, but as n goes to infinity, each of these polynomial entropy goes to infinity. So. So when you have infinity plus infinity minus this infinity and minus infinity here, uh, things can get very tricky. So one has to be careful, and it turns out in this case it's related to 
you know, the global index in this situation. And, and I think another fundamental reason is that the algebra is not type one. Okay, the type three factors is only for type three factors you have such uh, subtle uh, phenomena. Okay, so, all right, so yeah, so here's, um, here's a bit of a more discussion on duality. Um, right, so, um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think I'll use the last uh, maybe five, five minutes or so to discuss uh, um, my recent work on this duality. So um, this is my paper, Relative Entropy and Global Index. So I will just give you an, an example of, of, you know, a sequence of formulas uh, obtained in that paper, okay? So once again, let's, let's take, let's just take the free Fermi net or, you know, what I call the uh, net, conformal net, uh, which are related from Fermi net. So this is a technical condition here. So if you take the intervals I1, I2, and you take its complement, this complement, these are two disjoint intervals on the circle, so it's complement also two disjoint intervals on the circle, okay? Then um, one of the results in that paper is the following. So here is the relative entropy omega, omega J1 tensor omega J2, okay? So these are omega restricted J1, omega restricted J2, and take the tensor product. So this measures the distance between omega and this tensor product states, okay? And here you take its complement, okay? Here, C is the central charge here, logarithm of eta, eta is the cross ratio in this case. Here on the right hand side, we also have some kind of relative entropy, which um, let me explain what, what's on the right hand side. So we have omega, omega is the vacuum state, but Fi here is the conditional expectation from the commutant to this, uh, the observables localized on I1, I2. Okay, for those of you who know a bit about um, chiral conformal field theory, this conditional expectation, its index plays an extremely important role, okay? So here, uh, when you take the conditional expectation composed as omega, you get a state there, okay? You get a state um, on, this, on this algebra. So this is a relative entropy here, and this is the global index, okay? So um, I think this uh, equation is quite interesting. You got three relative entropies here. You got center charge appearing you also got global index appearing, okay? So, um, in fact, you know, for some of you who know, um, who, who work in conformal field theory, you know there is, there is such case where central charge and, um, you know, this is the special uh, modular matrix appear in the same equation, right? That's the modular transformation equation. But here we have got a relative entropy, and remember this relative entropy has very nice uh, non-negativity and monotonicity, right? So, yeah, and and uh, duality condition uh, holds when the right-hand side is equal to zero. So, for, for instance, it holds for free fermion case where mu a is equal to one. In fact, it's always true for for what's called uh, holomorphic CFT where the right-hand side is always zero. Okay, so it's just a very interesting um, identity uh, that's um, you know that comes from investigating uh, duality relation. Okay. I should mention that because of the special property of the um, relative entropy, you uh, play, you just use very simple property of this relative ent entropy, you get an inequality like this, okay, which is a result uh, already quite non-trivial. Okay. Anyway, so, um, right, so maybe I, uh, I will spend the last few minutes explaining, um, you know, how this duality relation is obtained and uh, explain one crucial ingredient in proving such result. Okay? So the proof of such a relation is partially based on the following result from our paper on relative entropy in the global index. And here's, here's a very, um, what I think very interesting identity. Okay? So here I got two conditional expectations, E2, E1. This is the relative entropy between omega and omega composed with E2, E1. Okay? It says in the suitable conditions, this is additive, okay? Okay, so I think this is quite interesting, good. Because we know that, you know, index, if you take a logarithm index, it's also additive, right? But uh, this, this is more general than index. Sometimes you can recover the index, okay? And um, this quantity is very interesting because, yeah, so let me make a comment on this. So this is what kind of, you know, potentially this is more refined invariant than index because 
as the interval gets closer to the circle, it actually recovers the logarithm of the index. So that the previous uh, identity here is just a additivity of logarithm of the index or multiplicativity of uh, composition of uh, subfactors. Okay, and uh, uh, one final thing is that uh, this this identity in a special case reduced to uh, what Cassini and, and, and his collaborators called uh, entropy um, entropic certainty principle, okay, which which is uh, which is a principle that they use um, to do, do some very interesting uh, physical um, uh, consequences. So I think um, I will refer you to uh, Cassini and his collaborators' papers on this. I think there is still uh, something one. This is more general, I have to say, and I think there's still more to uh, investigate about this um, um, about this identity. Okay, so I think I think I my time is almost up, so I'm going to stop recording here. And thank you for your attention. And once again, uh, please feel free um, to uh, to write to me uh, any of your questions or comments. Okay, I would uh, love to uh, have some interactions with uh, with you. On this topic. Okay, thank you. Since it's impossible to ask questions, <laughs> the session is closed now. See you this afternoon.